So just a quick fun fact, as we are starting to maybe approach what we could call kind of the end of Isaiah, right? Like kind of in that middle ground, there's 66 books, uh, or sorry, chapters in Isaiah. As we start to approach the end, just a quick fun fact, a lot of people think that the, uh, the man that, um, you know, put the divisions of chapters and verses into our Bibles, that he intentionally made Isaiah 66 chapters because he saw Isaiah as a summary of the entire Bible. And there are, you know, 66 books of the, of the Bible in, in that. So you can make your, your own judgment as we're going through it and as we all become experts in Isaiah together here. But um, just kind of a fun fact, that's uh, why some people think there are 66 uh, chapters. But we're in 49. We're going to wrap that up this week. Um, so let's read it and then pray to the Lord. We're in verse 13 through 26. We'll start in verse 14. Sorry, 14 through 26. It says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, you are engra- I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste, your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather, they come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste in your desolate places, in your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, This place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, Who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord. God, behold, I will lift up my hands to the nations and raise my signals to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. With their face to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty, or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. This is God's Word. Would you pray with me? God, we want to understand this this morning. We want to understand what it means to us today and how we should live in light of it. God, I pray that you would encourage and strengthen the saints' hearts today. God, I pray that they would all endure to the end, that they would conquer, God, that they would receive eternal life in you, God, that they would not be uh, led astray, God, but we would uh, hear these promises of your word, God, and that you would bless us. So we ask you to do this, God. We just open your words, and we want to hear from you this morning. So speak, we pray, Father, in your name. Amen. So last week, I explained why I don't do essential questions anymore. Um, and so uh, if you're new and you're wondering, you know, why are we reading just all these verses out of the Bible and then preaching through them? Uh, it's because uh, I see myself as a servant of the Lord. Keenan and I see ourselves as ambassadors of God. And a servant and an ambassador is not really free to just say whatever they want to say. Does that make sense? Like if, if a king sends a servant or sends an ambassador, he sends them with a purpose, with his word in their mouth. Right? I want you to say this on behalf of me. I want you to speak for me. Uh, and it's wrong if that servant or that ambassador just starts saying you know, whatever they want to say. And so out of a, uh, just a desire to just speak what has God said and have those in my mouth and impart those to you, uh, we consider ourselves servants of the Lord. That's how you should view us. Servants of the Lord and servants of you for your sake, right? for your upbuilding, uh, that you might reach eternal life. That's, that's, that's our job. And so we are reading from the text, hearing God's word, and, and preaching that, exposing that, reading that, uh, hope, hopefully uh, accurately explaining what the word of God means. 
And so here in, in Isaiah 49, we've got uh, uh, the second half of Isaiah 49 here. And if you were with us last week, you know that kind of the structure of this chapter is you've got the Israelites or uh, the servant speaking, and then you've got some lament. And God immediately responds to the lament of his servant. And then after that, you've got Zion here lamenting. Right? You see verse 14, Zion lamenting, which is Jerusalem, and the Lord immediately coming in and assuring. And we can see this pattern of lament in response. Lament in response. This is a conversation, this is what Isaiah 49, this is what's happening. It's a conversation between the servant and God and God's people and God. And it can be challenging, I think. I think you guys can agree with me on this. Sometimes you're reading the Old Testament and you're like, man, can I apply that? Like, is this... Like, is this for me? Like, is this for them? Is this, how, how do I fit in? How is this encouraging to me at all, right? Like, my wife's reading through Joshua right now, and uh, she's, I mean, she's loving it. She's just telling me all these stories about, like, battles happening. But we, none of us read Joshua and then go pick up a sword and look, for, right, and look for <laughs> somebody to kill. Right? That's ridiculous. None of us, does, so it's like, okay, how do I apply these things in the Old Testament to my life today? How do I do that? One of my big goals this morning is to give us as a church a framework for answering some of that question. That's probably one of the more complicated questions is how, how does the Old Testament, how does the law apply to us today? There are books and books and books written about that and different people have different opinions. Uh, but I, I just want us to be a group of people. I know you do too. You want to be a group of people that understand, revel, love, delight in God's Word. Really delight in it. And if we're honest, Sometimes the Old Testament can be a hindrance to that. If we're honest, sometimes we're reading the Old Testament and we just don't get it. How, what does this mean for me? How should I live then? Is this, okay, I know this is talking about God. Did God really do that, right? And so I, one of my big goals this morning is as we're showing, as I'm showing you what this text means and what it means for us, is to give us a framework for interpreting the Old Testament in large, in general. And if you'd like to talk to me more about that, uh, I would love, love, love to talk to you about that. Meet up and get coffee sometime and, and share with you more about where I'm getting these things. Okay? Um, so, uh, looking here at, at verses 14 through 26, uh, we can see that the Lord is first talking to Israel. Okay? So, one of, one of the important things for when we're reading the Old Testament, when we're interpreting it, is guys, it, can, it can't mean something that it didn't uh, necessarily mean to the people it was written to, okay? I, I don't mean that that doesn't mean we can't apply it to us. It does have application to us, but understanding who it was written to in the context it was written, what, the, what it means is really important for then transferring any kind of gleanings that we can take from it uh, for our own edification and learning. So uh, if you've been with us, you know that this is written to the exiles, this is written to the people in Israel. They've been taken away from their, their homeland. And, and this helps us to understand uh, verses like verse, um, verses like, look down at 16 and 17. The second half of 16 says, Your walls are continually before me. What could that mean? Well, this was written to the exiles, and they built this town of Jerusalem, and it was destroyed. And God's saying, The rubble of your walls, it makes me sad. It's before me. I see it, Jerusalem exiles. I see it. Your builders make haste. Make haste to do what? To repair the ruins. To rebuild it as we see will happen in Nehemiah and Ezra. As you get more familiar with your Old Testament, you'll understand the story of the Israelites and how it relates to us today. And so we can see that this is written to God's people. And one of the most significant parts of this chapter, look closely with me here, is this is a mirror image of God's covenant to Abraham. Do you see that? So if you're not familiar with what I mean by God's covenant to Abraham, uh, uh, at the very beginning, early on in Genesis, Genesis 12, God just calls this man named Abram. He, he wasn't a Jew. He, he, didn't, um, you know, he, he didn't have a special relationship with God. And God just says, I am going to bless you. And I'm going to bless the nations through you. And he says, I'm going to give you land. And I'm going to give you children. And I'm going to bless those who bless you. And I'm going to curse those who curse you. You can go read it in Genesis 12. And it's reiterated in Genesis 15. And again in Genesis 17. God promises them these things. Many children. Land. Uh, blessing for those who bless him. Curses for those who curse him. And look with me. This is a mirror image of that. This is a mirror image of that. Look at verses 17 and 18. <sighs> And maybe even um, the first half of 16. 
So when, or the second half of 16, he says, your walls are continually before me again. This is talking about the land, right? This is talking about Jerusalem. I see it. I haven't forgotten that land. Uh, uh, your builders make haste to do what? To restore the land, right? Uh, in verse 19 even, your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, it will be too narrow. So he's combining, he's saying you will be back in your land. And then when he's saying your land is going to be too narrow, why, is, why might this building be too narrow, right? Why might somebody come into this building and say it's too small? Because, praise be to God, it's full of people seeking uh, the Lord, right? It's the same thing here. If somebody comes into the land and they say, hey, it's too narrow. I want to be here. I want to be in Jerusalem. I want to be with you. I want to seek the Lord. Make room for me. We can see the twofold promise of God promising them land and many descendants. Many children. Do you guys see that? Do you see the many children? And he goes on and, and he says, the children of your bereavement, this is verse 20, will yet say in your ears, this place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. And then verse 21, you will say in your heart, <laughs> who has borne me these? Right? Where did all these children come from? Do you see that? It's a fulfillment of God's promises all the way back in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and put away. Many, many, many Israelites were slaughtered in the exile. Many of them were killed. They went from a great nation, millions of people, easily down to the thousands. They were an endangered people. And God is saying, you are going to look up, and you're going to look around, and you're going to say, how did I get this numerous? <laughs> how did this happen? It's like a miracle. Where did these people come from? God is promising. He has not forgotten that promise all the way back in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. And, and then God goes on to say that he will uh, raise his hand to the nations. God's promise to uh, Abraham was that he would be a blessing to the nations and that these people would uh, bless the people. And then we get to the end of the chapter and it's curses for God's enemies. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh. That's siege language, right? That's starvation language. That's uh, we are attacking them language. That's, uh, you're on the offensive. They will drink their own blood, as violent as that is. And then, once I fulfilled my promises, all flesh shall know the Lord. All flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Do you guys see that pattern? And, and so at its core, at its most basic level, that's what this uh, section of Scripture is about. It's about God telling these Israelites again, hey, there's a servant coming in the first half who's going to redeem you, and, and he's going to accomplish his work. He's going to lead you along still waters, and I have not forgotten you. This is hundreds of years later, and God is still on that promise that he made all the way back in Genesis. This is just amazing. And what are the Israelites, what are they saying? What are they lamenting about? The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. And so what's God's response? It's, no, I haven't <laughs> forgotten you. <laughs> I haven't even forgotten what I promised Abraham. How could I forget anything? I'm God. You are always before me. You're always before me. I've graven your name on my palms. Almost like he's putting his palms out for me. Look, you're right here. On my palms, as Russell Shea will see Christ's uh, wounds in his, in his palms. And so it's our Lord quick to just turn and comfort his people. Quick to turn and comfort his people. And I think, uh, gosh, like this is maybe, this is maybe a, a side application, maybe not a direct application, but guys, I just want to point us real quick to the character of our God here. Like, like what Israel is crying out about, like they're basically calling God unfaithful. He has promised to not desert Israel. And if they're saying, you've forgotten me, you're gone, where did you go? They are accusing God of unfaithfulness, right? But it's an honest just cry of their heart. Where did you go? Are you even real? Did you forget me? And sometimes when we go through trials, when we go through hard, hard, horrible things, uh, we'd, be, we'd be lying to ourselves. We didn't say we had some of those thoughts. Like, is, God, are you even, is this real? Right? Have I just been duped? Have I been deceived? Is there really a God? Is it, it was I just made from some primordial ooze that collected random mutations and the DNA somehow came together? And gosh, 
That would make a whole lot of sense for the suffering that's in the world. The Israelites were tempted to feel that too. And we can be uh, comforted in the fact that when we honestly cry and pray to God, what's he quick to respond with? Comfort. Comfort. But to the hypocrites, how did Jesus respond? To the hypocrites who didn't reveal their true heart, wouldn't pray to God, who didn't beat their chest and say, have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner. But to the hypocrites who said, thank you, God, that I'm not like this guy and that guy and the other God. God responds with not blessing, but with condemnation even. Guys, it's so important that we would be a people, we would be a people that are just genuine and honest before God. He knows your heart anyways. He knows your mind anyways. He knows your deepest thought. Have you questioned God's existence this month? Seriously, like if you, is this all even real at all? He already knows it. Take it to him in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Have you questioned whether he's good or he's forgotten you or if he really cares about you? I don't know what you're dealing with. Take it to him in prayer. But I, I want to get to a deeper, uh, I think, direct application of this word. Um, and, and that is we know that this is uh, written. And this is where I'm getting to kind of our framework for interpreting the whole Old Testament. Okay, It's going to be a fairly uh, short sermon this morning. But um, our, our framework for how we interpret the, maybe the whole Old Testament is we have to ask ourselves, okay, we know that this was written to Israel. We know that this was written to God's people. We know that it was written to them. Uh, and the question is, was it written only to them? Or, or is it written to God's people at large? Do you understand my question? So was this written strictly to ethnic Israel? Might be a way for me to put it. Or, or, or is this written to God's people in general? And if it was written to ethnic Israel, and if, if that's the case, this is only talking about ethnic Israel in that time, in that place, and that's all that matters, then we can learn this and we can read it and we can still maybe get something from it, right? We can say, okay, God is the kind of God that keeps his promises. Okay, God is the kind of God that is faithful. And those are good things. <laughs> those are really good things. But I'm going to share a lot of scripture here with you in a second. I, I interpret the Old Testament and really, it's a matter of interpreting our identity today as the church as written to God's people. And I would say that those that are God's people are those that have Christ. If you have Christ, you have God. If you do not have Christ, you do not have God. Even if you are a Jew, but if you reject the Lord Jesus, you are not God's people. And I know that might offend some of you. And I know that might bring up some questions for some of you, but I'm going to get to the scripture to back it up here in a second. So, so I want to show you the positive case here for why I interpret it this way and, and why it just makes this text explode with hope and joy for us. So if you want, if you can, um, if you would, would you turn with me now? Uh, would you turn with me over to, let's start in, um, let's, ter- let's start in Galatians chapter 3. Go to Galatians 3. Here's, here's why I think I have warrant to interpret this as not just applying to ethnic Israel in that time, but to God's people in general. Galatians chapter 3. Okay. Would you start with me in verse 14? Okay, the reason why God's people, Israel, the reason why they are blessed is because they've received some promises. They've received, in other words, a covenant from God. And so let's read what uh, Galatians 3, verse 14 says. It says, So that in Christ Jesus... Let's, let's start in verse 13 so it makes a little more sense with the context. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Right? This is the gospel, guys. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that... In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to whom? Might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive what? The promised spirit through faith. Where does the blessing come from? It comes from Abraham. The blessing and the promises that God gave to Abraham are now coming to who? The Gentiles. This is why it's so amazing. This is why Peter had to have a vision of things falling from the sky in order for him to go to the Gentiles because this was written and the promises were given to Abraham's descendants. And he's like, wait a second. The promises aren't just for Israel. They're for the whole world. This is amazing. God, you have a worldwide scope for what you're wanting to do with your promises, for what you're wanting to bring into Israel. This is mind-blowing. 
Uh, keep reading with me now. Let's, let's go down. Let's look at Galatians 3 again. Let's look at verses 26 through 29 now. This is a big part of what Galatians is about, right? Because these Gentiles in Galatians, they get saved, and some people are trying to say there, you have to act like a Jew, and Paul's saying, no, you, you, basically you already are Jews in one sense. You're not circumcised, but you are children of the circumcision. And Abraham, through faith, so read with me here, in verse 26, he says, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. And you are all one in Christ Jesus. For if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. Do you see that? You are Abraham's offspring. You are heirs according to what? The promise. Are you guys tracking with me? You get what I'm saying? What's the point of Paul saying, hey, there's no division between Jews and Greeks anymore? What's the point of him saying that? And the point is, right, that God has de- abolished that dividing wall. He's brought us together. We are one people of God. We're one people of God. And, and now I understand uh, that there's some text that, gosh, is that exactly, you know, I, Romans 11 is, is one that you should go and you should read, you should dig into. There's some things there uh, that, that I, I, are a bit of a mystery that we're going to have to work through and wait for the Lord to reveal in the end times. But the good news of the gospel, guys, is that we've been adopted into the family of God that we are children of Abraham through faith. And if we are children of Abraham, we are recipients of the promises of Abraham. And if that's true, right, then we can read Isaiah 49 with a new lens on (laughs) as God writing to his people. And who are his people? Us. We're his people. This is this is amazing. So I think Galatians shows it positively, and, and, and I have more texts here. Um, I don't want to bog you down, but I, I think Romans 4, 16, Romans 9, 7 through 8 also show this point. But I want to show you the point negatively now. In other words, I want to show you the point that, that if you don't have Christ, you are not God's people regardless of your ethnicity. Right? From these stones I could raise up children of Abraham. Isn't that what John said? <laughs> right? So, so turn with me over to here to Revelation 2.9. And, and I just I think it's really important that I ground this argument in Scripture. That's why we're jumping around so much. So thank you guys for being willing to jump around. I, I think it'll do us good in the long run, okay? Revelation 2.9 says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. I love that. <laughs> Sorry, I keep going. Anyways, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Did you read that? Like, you want to talk about offensive? Our Lord Jesus here is saying, these people think they're Jews, but they don't have me. They don't believe in me. They don't know me. They are persecuting you, Christians. And so they're of the synagogue of Satan. And God repeats it. He says it again in verse 9, chapter 3 again, verse 9. He says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, uh, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before you, before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. What was the, what was, what's the big issue that the Jews had in the day? You're not Jews. You can't claim these promises. These aren't for you. These are for me. And God's saying, I will show them that I have loved them because they have received me in my son, Jesus. Let's, let's look at one more. Look at one more here. Let's look at 1 John 2.3. First John 2.23. just a few pages back from there. 1 John 2.23 says this, says, No one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Do you guys get where I'm coming from with this? Have I, have I convinced you? <laughs> have I made my point? The children of Abraham are those that walk in faith like Abraham. And anyone who does not have faith in God is not a child of Abraham. 
Anyone who does not have God, have faith in God is not a child of Abraham. Everyone who does have faith in God is a child of Abraham, who is our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It is Jesus. Everyone who has the Son has the Father. And so was Isaiah 49 written to God's people? Was it written to the Jews? Absolutely. And I would ask, who are the true Jews? What does Revelation 2 and 3 teach us? Who are, in one sense, the true Jews? The Christians. The people that don't reject Jesus. I'm not being anti-Semitic. I pray to God that the Jews would come and would know the Lord Jesus. I'm not trying to say anything poor about the Jews that are in Israel. That's not my intention. I'm trying to make a positive claim about the Christian church that we are the children of God. Maybe not ethnically, but religiously. We are the children of God. Spiritually, we're the children of God. So go back with me now to Isaiah 49. What this means is that the promises of, of Abraham are our promises. <laughs> this, like, this should make you smile. This is a really, really good thing, right? Like, I was mentioning my wife was reading Joshua. How do you interpret that? The same promises of blessing that caused God to wipe out entire armies to fulfill His promise to His people are ours today in the church. The promises that God would bless them and give them numerous children, numerous descendants are ours today in the church. The promises that God will bless those who bless us and curse those who curse us are ours today in the church, right? Uh, this gives a whole new meaning to us talking about ourselves as a family. Right? Like when you get saved, you are adopted into the family of God. What does Paul say? He says, you have uh, thousands of mentors, but you do not have many fathers. He says, I am your father in Christ. You've been adopted, brought in, a child of God. And so when we live together, church, when we work together, right, we are coming together under this banner of God's people and God's children uh, uh, obtaining these promises, and we should love each other dearly. We should love one another dearly because you are truly in the Lord, brothers and sisters. Whoever led you to the Lord is in one sense your father in Christ. And, and I know Jesus says, don't, you know, don't, have, don't call yourself father, but I mean, Paul did it in Corinthians, so I think I'm safe. I can show you that passage if you'd like. We are children of God, children of one another. This means our salvation. It was not just us getting a ticket to heaven. It was not just a wiping away of our sin. It was adoption into a family. It was adoption into the people of God who he's been faithful to from Gen Genesis to today. <laughs> it's amazing. And it's a little awkward and weird to get into a family, right? Like, my married folks, like, you guys can relate to this. Like, the first time you had dinner with your in-laws, right? You're a part of this family now, but it's just kind of like, ah, am, you know, I kind of am. I'm kinda, it's kind of awkward. Like, I remember eating dinner with Becca's family, and they just converse in movie quotes, <laughs> which would be fine if they were normal movies, but they're not. Like, movies you've never heard of, they do, I'm like sitting here, I'm like, this is a foreign language. I cannot talk to these people, but I was deeply in joy and love with them. Right? Like, I just sat there and ate my food and smiled. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> and I just wanted to know the videos. I just want to watch the movies. I wanted to speak the lingo. I wanted to be in with them. I wanted to be more engrafted with them. I want to know who they are. I want to know how I should live and how I should walk and how I should talk. And should I help with dishes or should I not? Should I pray? We do this thing where we squeeze hands and it goes around the table and I just get to be a part of this family. And when we're reading our Old Testament, we're learning to be a part of the family. We're Gentiles that have been grafted into this family of God and it's rich with history and it's rich with promises. And God is saying, I can't forget you. Could a mother forget her child? She might, but I'll never forget you. We're grafted into a family that our God loves that much. He says, you're always on my hands. I can say that to you, church. I'm not misappropriating the text. I can say it to you because we are God's people. Just, just one more, just in case you're not quite convinced, just one more. I just want to give you an example of Paul doing it. Just one more. 
Okay, so uh, in, in, in the first half of Isaiah 49, uh, we, we read about how God is saying that, um, you know, he is going to uh, save his people, and, and he says, today is the day of salvation. So look at verse 8. He says, thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. Do you see that? Isaiah 49, verse 8. Please, please tell me, church, you, that rings a bell in your mind. You've heard that before, haven't you? Yeah, yeah you, have, you, you read it in 1 Corinthians, I think. Chapter 4, I'm missing my notes here. I think 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Yeah, verse, uh, maybe 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But the Lord telling his people, today is the day of salvation. And Paul is not talking to Jews. He's talking to Gentiles. He's saying, hey, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day for you to be grafted into this family. Today is the day of salvation. Not just applying it to the ethnic people of Israel, but to all who would believe. To all who would believe. These are just tremendous promises. And they affect the way we read our Bibles. And they affect the way we love one another. And they affect the way we raise our kids. And they affect the way we share the gospel. They affect everything because God has promised it. And we're just walking in confidence of his promises. So if God has promised us, this this is my last point. If God has promised us children... And, and I think he has because he promised it to all the descendants of Abraham and we are descendants of Abraham. Then in all of our evangelism, right, all of our uh, sharing the gospel with our neighbors, it's just done in faith. Man, God has promised that he will grow his church. <laughs> right? Like, like there's a kind of optimism that comes with that. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes we can just be negative. Like, man, the church is dying. The world's dying. Everything's dying. Is everybody going to follow Christ? Jesus, come back. Right? Like, Like we can have this mindset, but if the promises of God are true for the church today, we have no reason for negativity. We might be persecuted, right? Uh, The church in America might shrink, but worldwide, God's vision and God's plan and his purposes for the world will be accomplished. Why? Because he promised and he's faithful to his promises. And so I go share the gospel with my neighbor, asking the Lord to give me spiritual children. Asking the Lord that I might not be a barren believer, right? And just claiming his promises here and and hoping that this man will get saved in the promises of God. And there's this new sense of optimism and positivity. Do do you get what I'm saying? When I said optimism and positivity, it sounded like a psychology hype thing. That's not what I'm trying to do here at all. I'm not just saying just be positive and happy. I'm saying have faith in the promises of God and that they apply to our lives today. Does that make sense? I, I think that this is a massive topic, right? Uh, we, we could try to go into it today, but it would be a very, very long time, right? How, how do all those promises, how do they get played out today? What does land look like today? Is that the Great Commission, right? How does, how does many children get, looked like, get played out today? Is that evangelism? How does blessing those who bless us get played out today? How does cursing those who curse us get played out today? How does the family of God work out today? But I think I... My hope, my goal this morning was to give us a framework for understanding this text and it's a deep reason for encouragement. Amen? Amen. So if you want to talk about this more, I think this is what Isaiah 49, 13 is talking about. We, as recipients of this promise, can remember the Lord has not forsaken us. He has promised us some great and precious promises. And I would challenge you to walk in those in faith. To, to be the ones that went and took Canaan right? Don't be those that are afraid and didn't claim the promises of God, but were afraid, right? But go step in in faith. And if you step in in faith, this is salvation. If you're wondering this morning, man, how do I get into this family of God? (laughs) My family's rotten, and I feel like my friends don't care about me, and I just need a family. How do you get into this family? It's in faith. You look to Jesus, You believe that he died to save you from all of your sins. And in believing that, you see the glory of God and you're adopted into this family. So let's love one another like it. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Father, we pray that you would bless this teaching of your word. God, I know that I'm not uh, the greatest teacher in the United States. I know that for sure, Lord. And yet, I pray that your word would move powerfully. I pray that you would open up the Old Testament to us, that it really would be profitable for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. God, that we would hear you saying these things were written down as an example for our sake today, God. And that we would understand your word, that we would learn it, that we would claim our identity as children of God, and that we would walk as children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, loving one another. And Lord, we just pray you give us children. 
Pray that we wouldn't be barren believers, God, but as we share and as we invite and as we love our neighbors, Lord, would you save them? Would you give them faith? Would you open their eyes to see the glory of God? And we just pray that this family would grow and grow and grow. Lord, blessed is the man who has many children. Blessed. And Lord, we just pray that that would be us, Father. We love you, Lord. We pray you do this for your namesake. Amen.